Hello and welcome to Revision Tips for SIPS Level 2, Certificate in Procurement and Supply Operations. This is Module 2, Procurement and Supply Operations, and it's Learning Outcome 4, which is to understand pricing methods used in purchasing of goods and services. So all of the pricing methods and strategies you'll have learned about have a place in procurement. And to make an informed decision for a particular need, considering the advantages and disadvantages of each type would be really useful. And a contract can be made up of different strategies for different areas of the agreement. The ultimate goal for building long term strategic and collaborative supply relationships is to agree a form of pricing that will result in a win win situation. So what factors do we need to consider when deciding on the most suitable type of contract? How much profit does an organisation want or need to make? How important is the supply relationship? What is the supply relationship like? What are the costs involved? Is any investment needed? Does the supply have capacity and capability? Are the market prices stable? And could the job be done quickly and more quicker than suggested? How much risk should be taken? So let's look at a scenario now. Simon works for a dressmaking factory. Based on previous year's orders, he places an order for 10,000 zips that can be called off over the course of the next year. As a result of placing the large order, Simon secures a good fee for them. Why might Simon have chosen to place a blanket order at a fixed fee rather than making spot purchases? And what could happen if it turns out that Simon's organisation doesn't need all 10,000 zips in the course of the year. So let's look at that fixed pricing example. I mean, clearly the advantages are that the price will remain the same throughout the year, which makes it much easier for the buyer to budget. Stock is readily available to be called off by the buyer when the buyer needs it. And there's a lot less admin cost because it's one order that covers a much larger quantity. But the downside is it could be cheaper if the market price decreases. Price might be slightly higher because the, but the, I suppose the supply doesn't know if there's any risk involved in giving you a fixed price. And the supplier have to commit to holding lots of stock. Let's look at lump sum pricing then. I'm going to give you another scenario. Bradley manages a building company. He's been asked to provide a lump sum quote for a building job. Bradley knows there are risks associated with, with this as there could be some unknowns. He makes sure he takes all of his costs into account and adds on some contingency budget before. But what cost does Bradley need to have included? Direct costs such as labour and materials, as well as indirect costs, overheads, plus contingency and profit. What other pricing methods could Bradley have suggested that would have resulted in lower risk for him? So clearly the advantages of lump sum pricing is the buyer knows exactly what they're going to pay for the whole project. Supplier knows how much they're going to be paid, which helps them to budget. But if the market rises, the buyer may not be affected as the lump sum price remains the same. And therefore, the buyer isn't exposed to any risks with regards to price rises. The payments can be staged, which will help the buyer's cash flow. But the downside, supplier could charge more and, if you, and would have been less, should I say, if you had used a different strategy. The buyer could purchase the goods or services cheaper using another strategy and the supply name may not be able to take make the budgeted profit if the supply market rises and the supplier takes on the risk of the market price rises 
but as the payments are staged, it means the supplier doesn't receive all the money until the end of the contract, even if the manufacturer all inventory at the start. So let's look at schedule of rates. We'll give you another scenario to consider. Kasia can't decide if she wants to get carpet or laminate flooring in her flat, but she knows the maximum amount of money she can spend on it. She asks a local floor fitter to supply schedule of rates so she can compare prices per square meter for materials and fitting of the two different methods. How can the schedule of rates help her decide what to choose? Because she'll be able to see price per square meter and compare the costs easily. So the advantages of schedule of rates, the buyer knows exactly how much they will have to pay for the goods or service. And the buyer can send orders as and when they're needed with very little forward planning. But the downside is the price could rise and it could be higher than using other forms of strategy. Supplier often doesn't prioritize schedule of rates work over those that are paying a much higher price. Okay, we're now going to look at cost reimburse and cost plus arrangements. Should we revisit that um, scenario from Bradley, the building company scenario? This is the one where he was asked to provide a lump sum quote for a building job and he knows there are risks associated with it because there are some unknowns. He needs to think about direct costs and indirect costs plus contingency and profit. So let's compare the two pricing methods from Bradley's point of view and from the supplier's point of view. Let's say the job turns out easier than Bradley had feared or the job turns out more complex than Bradley had costed for. The cost reimbursable and cost plus arrangements will provide Bradley with a little bit more flexibility. But it will also provide the buyer with an opportunity to save money if these uncertainties aren't as high as they were worrying about. So the good thing is the supplier is guaranteed to get their costs repaid. Simple way of agreeing prices with transparency on both sides. And if a fixed fee is agreed on top of the cost, the supplier knows exactly how much profit they will make from the outset. Everything is well documented in the contract and all the supplier's costs can be covered. But the downside is the buyer will not be able to budget effectively as there is no fixed pricing. The buyer will not know the exact cost of the project until completion. And if a fixed fee is agreed, the supplier could have made more money if a percentage fee had been negotiated. The contract is often complex to write and some contracts do not include indirect costs. So now we'll look at variable pricing and we'll, we'll lead to another scenario. Marshall is administrator for a sales team of a large mobile phone organisation. Each week she uses a price monitoring website to find the cheaper deals on petrol in the town where she is located and she emails all the staff with company car details of the cheapest price. She discovers that she could achieve greater savings by signing up to a fuel card contract. So these are diff two different pricing methods that offer advantages and disadvantages. But let's look at variable pricing. The buyer gets the advantage of low prices when the market drops. Supplier can negotiate a percentage fee on top of the market price, so can budget what their profit will be after costs. And the supplier is not exposed to any risk. The downside though is the buyer gets the disadvantage of high prices when the market rises and the buyer cannot easily budget for how much a contract will cost, meaning the buyer is exposed to all the risks. Okay, so target pricing. Thinking back to one of the examples we had earlier, the, um, the building company that was asked to provide a lump sum, we've looked at that again in comparison to um, cost plus and now we're going to look at it from target price point of view. So with target pricing the supplier knows how much profit they're going to make. 
buyer knows how much it's going to cost them. But the buyer may get a share of extra profit the buyer makes if they complete the deal under the agreed target price. So the buyer is not exposed to any risk. And this strategy works on a high level of trust, so relationships will need to be very strong. But the downside is supply could have made more money using a different strategy. And he could have negotiated a better deal using a different strategy as well. Supplier could keep their surplus profit if a different strategy had been agreed. And the supplier is exposed to the risk. If they don't achieve the agreed target price, they risk losing money. And buyers can take advantage of this relationship if it's not collaborative. OK, we're now going to look at risk and reward, which works on a little bit like a no win, no fee basis. So here's a scenario to think about. Ingrid is a workflow consultant who specialises in lean manufacturing. She signs a contract for manufacture for virtual blinds with the following terms. $350 as a day rate. To achieve 10% cost savings by identifying waste within the production workflow and suggesting and implementing new work processes to address the inefficiencies. If she meets the 10% cost saving target within two months, she will be paid a bonus for 20% of the value of the cost saving. If she exceeds the 10% cost savings, she'll be paid 25% of the value of the costs saving as a bonus. Chris, another consultant, has suggested a daily rate of £500 with no bonus. So what factors would you need to consider before deciding which supplier's pricing arrangement is most advantageous for you as a buyer? So risk reward pricing is where the buyer is not exposed to any risk at all. It's a no win, no fee um, basis. It incentivizes the supplier to achieve, which means they can make extra money if they meet or exceed their objectives. The buyer doesn't have to pay if the supplier doesn't achieve the objectives, but the buyer could still have benefited from the contract. It enables suppliers to clearly monitor the contractual outcomes. The downside, supplier is exposed to all the risk. Buyer could be paying more than other forms of contracts if the supplier meets their targets. The more risk the supplier takes, the higher the reward. Um, supplier might not get paid if they don't meet the objectives, but could have still put in lots of work. So they need to be very sure that they can make that saving. And it sets robust objectives that have to be met by the supplier. That's the end of Learning Outcome 4. Thank you for watching.